Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the last uh, Reservoir Sedimentation Management Series webinar. Um, the talk today will be given by Dr. Rowland Hotchkiss, who is a professor and chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Brigham Young University. Um, among his many accolades, uh, Dr. Hotchkiss is uh, chair of the ASCE EWRI Task Committee on Reservoir Sediment Management and Chair of the Environmental Advisory Board of the Chief of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the talk that uh, Dr. Hotchkiss will be given today is called The Economics of Sustainable Reservoir Sediment Management. Thank you, Toby. I appreciate that and welcome everybody to this uh, last webinar. I hope you can hear me okay. You might notice if you can see video, uh, my, my office is pretty sparse right now. We're getting a new uh, engineering building this summer. And right outside that window, about 20 feet away, is the building itself. I hope Murphy's Law doesn't work today because that would mean there'll be some really loud construction noise during this webinar. I hope that's not the case. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my good colleague and friend, Dr. George Annandale, who unfortunately can't be with us today. His vision and keen insight into so many different uh, physical processes have provided a path for all of us to follow. So uh, I miss George today. I'm grateful for help from, uh, from Mr. Todd uh, Agast, an economist at the Bureau. Uh, he's been a great one to bounce ideas off of and to provide me a lot of good information about discount rates. Tana, I appreciate your help. Tim Randall is the chair of the National Reservoir Sedimentation and Sustainability Team. And because of his leadership, we've had this series of webinars. Um, great job, Tim, and great leadership you've, you've shown. And Toby Minear has uh, produced all of these webinars and has made it as easy as possible for those of us who are presenting. Uh, presenting a webinar is a singular experience. I, I wish all of our participants today do that at least once. It's quite, an, it's quite an experience. Lastly, I acknowledge and thank my graduate student, Chris Garcia, who has crunched a bunch of numbers we'll be looking at a little bit later on. So this is the roadmap that we'll be talking about today. And you can keep track of where we are in the webinar by looking in the lower left-hand corner, as you'll see um, a section identifier there. So I'm going to review one slide from the webinar I gave a few weeks ago, and, and, and that's to begin to answer the question, how did we get to where we are today? And it starts with the philosophy of dam design in the United States. When considering a dam, one of the first questions to answer is, what elevation will the lowest outlet be placed at? The lowest outlet, that would be uh, right here. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you estimate the sediment deposition in the reservoir for a so-called economic design life, and we'll be talking about that phrase a lot today. Then you conceptually place that volume of sediment in the reservoir topographically, and then you put your lowest level outlet above that. Now, what that means is that the storage beneath that level is good for nothing. As a matter of fact, it's called dead storage. And that's the approach that's been taken as far as I know of here in the US. Now, I'd like to provide some commentary on this uh, philosophy. I remember Tim Randall telling us as a group that the dam owner, the person who finances or owns or constructs or who's liable for the dam, is under no legal obligation to store sediment. And I find that very interesting. And this practice of providing dead storage is a guarantee of a non-sustainable design. This concept of economic life, it's an artificial construct, usually 50 or 100 years, and it's simply a period of time to compare alternatives for a project. It has nothing to do with the physical longevity of the project itself. 
And finally, uh, some commentary. Many of our dams here in the Western US are, are really large. Carryover storage is required, meaning that it takes more than one year to fill the reservoir. And that comes into play too, as we talk about sediment management. Now, back in the day, uh, there are some things that I believe were not understood as well as we, um, in retrospect, understand today. The first is the importance of moving sediment downstream. There's a quote on the right-hand side of your stream uh, screen that says 24 out of the world's 33 major deltas are sinking. And part of that is due to a lack of sediment from upstream because so much of it is trapped in reservoirs. Neither uh, did we understand, and we still don't have a very good understanding of how to move sediment downstream of large dams. Some other things that weren't understood very well though, and when we will be talking about the benefit cost analysis today, and when considering that procedure, that analysis did not include damages averted by passing sediment downstream. For example, here is some downstream scour, and this is common downstream from dams, and, and, and that causes a lot of damage that's not included um, in the benefit cost. Neither is the cost of upstream deposition. And we'll go into this in a little bit more detail in, in just a few minutes. So the result is a non-sustainable design. And this graphic is courtesy of George Annandale. On the graph here, we have time. And on the y-axis is water supply reliability. And without uh, managing sediment at a reservoir, that reliability goes down with time because storage decreases with time. What we'll be talking about today is a sustainable operation where sediment periodically is removed, restoring storage, and extending the life of the reservoir. That's what we'll be talking about today. So how do we get there? I'd like to show you some examples of a couple of dams in the US that um, have suffered uh, because of the design philosophy and decisions that were made at the time of construction. The first one is well known to the Bureau of Reclamation, the Paonia Dam and Reservoir closed in 1962. It's an earth-filled dam on Muddy Creek. Now, any time you're gonna build a dam on a creek whose name is Muddy, uh, you better watch out. It's 200 feet high. There's a concrete intake tower and spillway. This spillway is shown here in the photo. About 21,000 acre feet, relatively small, built for irrigation, and a 50 year so-called design life. That was the uh, volumetric determination of incoming sediment over 50 years. So at the time of construction, an intake tower was built. All of this was uh, designed for dead storage for sediment to drop out. And here's where the water leaves the reservoir. Of course, during uh, summer, uh, the intake tower is, you know, the reservoir is full of water. That was in 1962. What does it look like today? We, we've seen these photos in this series of webinars before. That's what it looks like in about 2015. So guess what? The dead storage is full. Well, okay. The current status, um, that dead storage filled a little bit faster due to dam operation, but actually the predictions were pretty much right on the money for the considerations at the time. The outlet works now get compromised with woody debris and uh, they, they have to remove that woody debris by hand or very carefully with machinery. And they're unable to fully meet downstream needs. Now in talking with Tim and Sean Kimbrell at the Bureau, um, they actually spoke with a retired employee who was involved in the design. They actually considered a sluice way at the time of construction for moving uh, sediment downstream, but guess what? it wasn't justified economically. And they were concerned about operational durability, but it didn't pencil out in the benefit cost analysis. So the question that we all ask is, what did they think was gonna happen? That you no longer need the storage and water delivery after this period of time? Well, 
The other example is Gavin's Point Dam on the Missouri River. Uh, entire seminars and meetings have been devoted to this uh, facility. Closed in 1955 by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, built on the Missouri River, the most downstream of six dams and the smallest, essentially a re-regulating reservoir. It has spillway gates, uh, turbines, it uh, generates hydro. A larger uh, dam, 450,000 acre feet of storage. This map shows the dam on the right hand side and as you move upstream, you pass Springfield, South Dakota, and a major tributary right here, the Niobrara River, comes in upstream from the original reservoir. Now the Niobrara contributes 2,000 tons of sand every day to this river. The depositional delta has uh, begun to proceed downstream toward the dam, still several miles away, but it has extended the upstream backwater significantly. The dead storage, by the way, down at the dam is just fine because the sediment is depositing upstream. If we take a look at a recent uh, Google map, uh, here is the depositional part of that uh, delta coming out of the Niobrara. Uh, this has caused a lot of damage, we'll touch on later. Now downstream from the dam, uh, the stream channel is scoured up to 10 feet for many, many miles downstream. So this is another example of, uh, at the time, non-sustainable design. Some decisions at Gavin's Point. Originally, it was cited to be upstream from the Niobrara River. I find that just very interesting. But finally, the decision was made to make it downstream. The spillway gates on the dam itself are not located at the bottom of the dam. Uh, studies are now underway to see what can be done with this huge, huge volume of sand in the reservoir that's not going downstream. Um, coincidentally, on the downstream side of the dam, they really need sand. There are two endangered birds, the piping plover and least tern, that both require a sandbar habitat in the middle of a river for rearing. And so the Corps is um, obligated to spend money to bring sand in artificially to create these islands. So then let's talk about sustainability. Uh, it's been a very popular word. It's the, probably the most popular buzzword of our, the last 10 or 20 years. There's a lot of definitions for this and sustainability was not a buzzword when these dams were built. But the Brutland Commission uh, describes a sustainability and, and the last phrase is very important. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, it's so easy to say this word. And if you look at your organizational literature, you'll see it there. But rarely do we stop down and think about the economics of sustainability. And that's what we're doing today. What does it mean? What are we implying when we say sustainability? So let's ask the question then, is a dam and reservoir sustainable? Well, from Economics 101, the most very basic textbook that you can buy, um, it answers the question. Now, when we build a dam, we create a resource. That resource is storage. That is the resource. Now, if that storage is preserved over time, the project is sustainable. It's almost like we're planting a forest. We want that forest to be there. If we cut down some trees, we plant two more in its place, et cetera. So if storage is preserved over time, it's sustainable. But if it's permanently lost, well, it's, it's not sustainable. It's, it's as easy as that. So here we have the Matillaha Reservoir and uh, Toby Minear has worked on this. Here it is in its uh, heyday when there wasn't a lot of sedimentation. Now it's full of sediment. The dam has been partly uh, deconstructed so uh, an example of a non-sustainable project. So what do you think about this? Uh, this is an interesting concept. Uh, this is what um, Don Bondurant said in 1970, quite famous hydraulic engineer in the Missouri River Division of the US Army Corps of Engineers. And he didn't know what the future held, 
but uh, he was thinking maybe, you know, maybe at the end of our design life, when dead storage is full, maybe we wouldn't need the dam anymore. Um, well, we still do. So he emphasizes the importance to ensure their continued functioning. But here in the United States, we have not ensured continued functioning yet. So these slides, uh, this series of slides is from Tim Randall. Tim, thank you. No action is to let the reservoir eventually fill with sediment, hopefully before you retire, or hopefully before you retire, maybe after you retire, Tim. But uh, intergenerational inequity is a big phrase, but it works out this way for dams and reservoirs. The first generation conceives, plans, designs, constructs a dam and reservoir. It takes a long time to do that. And it almost occupies the full career of folks. The second generation starts getting benefits from the dam, recreation, hydropower, flood, uh, reduction, uh, you name it, all those great benefits. Begin repaying capital costs and the uh, minor O&M costs in the early years. The third generation, and we're talking, you know, 30 years of generation or so, continues receiving benefits, um, continuing to pre repay the capital, paying O&M that probably starts to creep up. But now the fourth generation pays for O&M, but not for sediment management. So who's left holding the bag? The last generation is stuck with a retirement bill. That is retire the dam because it's full of sediment. Uh, project benefits have been compromised and, and you've got to look around for water storage elsewhere. So this is uh, intergenerational inequity. Uh, lots of syllables in that phrase, and that's what it means. So now I'm changing the topic, and we'll review a benefit cost analysis approach. And the question was in the 1930s for the federal government of the United States, how can you compare several alternatives for the same water project? Well, a three-step idea was conceived. That is, design, uh, decide on a design time horizon for economics. And that's where we get like 50 years, or 100 years, a lot of times 50 years. And then year by year, estimate all benefits and costs. So this graphic shows a timeline, time zero, this is where a dam would be constructed. This then goes out into the future. And for every year, you would estimate your revenue, positive, and your costs, maintenance. The biggest cost, of course, is the capital cost of construction. So we have this benefit and cost string, and then by using equations, we can convert all of these revenues and all of these costs to present value. Now this has been codified in the United States, and it is by law the method that shall be used. And it's been in, in force now for 80 years the benefit cost analysis approach. How does it work? Well, just consider savings accounts. Let's say you're going to invest a nickel into the bank today. What will that be worth in 50 years? Let's say your interest rate is 7%. Well, the equation to calculate that is right here. It's not a difficult one. And after 50 years, you'd have $1.47. Well, that's asking the question about future value. What we're doing with benefit cost though, is we're taking a future benefit and we're bringing it back to present value. So let's ask the question in reverse. If I had a dollar 47, 50 years from now, what would it be worth today with an interest rate of 7%? Well, the equation is different, but we, it's back to a nickel. Well, what that means is if, if I've got a benefit of $1.47, 50 years in the future, it's only worth a nickel at present value. And that really hurts when we talk about sustainable design. So let's just do a couple of graphs here and show the uh, impact on discount rate. Discount rate is the, uh, I suppose, the preferred term that we use in benefit cost. So on this graph, we have discount rate in percent, zero all the way up to 16, 
I've highlighted a couple here, 2.75 and another one at seven, just for um, purposes of illustration. So what is the present value then of a dollar 50 years in the future? What's the present value? Well, it, with a discount rate of 2.75%, it's about a quarter. So 75% of that, that benefit has been lost. At 7%, the benefit is, is only uh, like, like three and a half cents. So we lose a lot of those future, those benefits discounted back to the present value. Another way to look at this is, how long does it take to lose 90% of a future benefit? So again, on the x-axis, we have discount rate going from two to 15%. And here, the number of years required to reduce the future value of a dollar down to a nickel. Well, let's take 7%. It takes 40 years to do that. And that's certainly within the time horizon of most projects. 50 years is the most common, and, and that um, an interest rate of only 6% reduces our benefit by 95%. So the question, and a big question in benefit cost is what interest rates are actually used? And this is where I thank uh, Todd uh, Gaston from the Bureau of Reclamation. We are required by law for federal projects to use the U.S. plan formulation rate from the Treasury Department. Currently this year, 2018, it's 2.75%. Now, the World Bank, which funds projects outside of the United States in many, many different countries, uh, they've got quite a range of interest rates that they use. The mean is 11.23%. The range is from 4.3 to about 47%. I would not be interested in investing in that last project. So what is the present value then of a dollar 50 years into the future? Well, as I indicated on the previous slide, it's discounted to about 25 cents this year, 2018, here in the US. What is it discounted to using the average world bank rate? Well, it's, it's, it's really low. And this discourages uh, sustainability. So in this graph, I'll explain what I've done. I've got two graphs. This is a time graph of the plan and formulation interest rate. Interest rate is on the y-axis and year in the United States is on the x-axis. And the plan and formulation interest rate has varied quite a lot over time. A high of about 9% in the late 1980s. I remember this well, it's when I bought my first house and the interest rate on my house was outrageous. But it steadily declined uh, for many years following that. Now the graph on the bottom of your picture is a dams by completion date built in the United States. So on the X axis is decade and the bar shows how many dams were built. So for example, in the 1960s here in the US, 19,768 dams were built. Okay, well, what was the interest rate used on, on the federal projects at that time? It was about 3%. Now, 3% is relatively low, but it's high enough that for Paonia Reservoir, even though a sluiceway was considered, it was not included because it didn't pan out in the economics, even at 3%. So I hope you find that interesting and informative. Now, what I'd like to uh, highlight though for a moment is a real shortcoming of the benefit cost analysis. And that is that the costs of sediment damage are not included. We've learned in previous webinars that sediment deposits upstream from a project, even far upstream from the original project lake service area. We've also learned that there is scour downstream that can cause damages of all kinds. Let's take Gavin's point as an example. As a result of my Freedom of Information Act request, we determined 
that upstream from Gavin's point, expenditures for sediment damage using a present value has been $257 million since closure in 1956. Now, if we were to build Gavin's Point today, it would cost $368 million. Well, the upstream damages then account for 70% of the construction cost. And that does not include downstream damages. I know they're higher, but they're not documented. So the benefit cost analysis, a real shortcoming, is not including damages due to deposition and scour. Now granted, back in the 1950s, the actual uh, monetary damage or even some of the physical processes were not as well understood as they are now. But uh, this is a real shortcoming of benefit cost. So how do we move toward sustainability? How do we do that? The graph here, similar to the one I showed a little while ago, again shows time with all the revenue strings. But now reality says that your revenue string is going to decrease over time due to sedimentation. This depends somewhat on the benefit. For example, flood control benefits are truly compromised. Hydro benefits, on the other hand, can be sustained for quite some time. In reality, O&M is going to increase with time, especially when at the end of the useful life of a project, when benefits have been exhausted due to sedimentation, you need to decommission it. That's reality. What might this look like with sediment management? With sediment management, I'd like you to notice at the end that time doesn't end with this artificial construct of 50 years or 100 years. It can go indefinitely into the future. We might have slightly reduced revenue from the get-go, but it will be sustained for hundreds of years. Maintenance costs will also be relatively low for the duration because we've invested more money. This is where the extra money is invested. And right now, using a 50-year time horizon, it doesn't make economic sense. This is why we are where we are today. So how do we move towards sustainability? Well, there hasn't been a dam, a new dam of consequence built in the United States for some years, but a complete benefit cost analysis will really help to include those, those damages averted from deposition upstream and scour downstream. This will require slightly smaller dams be built in the future than we've built in the past. They're much easier to manage sediment. For existing dams, well, we need to inventory, we need to find out what the problems are and prioritize them. And this is a real challenge when you have multiple dams on the same river. This is not easy. Okay, so the subcommittee on sedimentation recently passed a bold resolution on reservoir sedimentation and sustainability. I'll let you read it here. It's a three paragraph statement. The acronym of the subcommittee on sedimentation is SOS. That in itself is probably significant. But they are truly encouraging federal agencies to come up with plans for sediment management. They continue. They're also encouraged to start developing sustainable reservoir sediment management plans for one or two years on a pilot basis. And previous webinars have discussed the technical means for doing this. There's probably a dozen different ways to manage sediment at reservoirs. Right now, for example, 3,800 federal dams. Finally, they conclude that future planning studies will truly need to address sustainability the number of sites for dams is decreasing. <clears throat> Excuse me, we've used up the best ones already. Where does that leave us? Well, I'd like to uh, wrap up this webinar today by discussing a feasibility tool that we can use. This is called ResCon 2. And ResCon 2 is named after Reservoir Conservation Model Version 2. 
the original model was authored by George Annandale in the, in, in, at the turn of the century. Version two is, is much more advanced. You can download it at this web address. Now what ResCon2 does is it compares all those sediment management alternatives that have been highlighted in previous webinars, but then it, it puts those in an economic context. You specify the discount rate and you're looking to see if a dam can be managed so it's sustainable. It can be used for both existing dams and dams that are currently being designed. It is a feasibility tool, meaning that um, should only be used at the feasibility stage, not for uh, final decisions. So what does this ResCon do? It requires a lot of input. This is not something that you say, well, hey, let's build a dam in Northern California. Let's sit down this afternoon and run this model. You need a lot of data that describes the reservoir geometry, height, capacity, dead storage, et cetera. Hydrology and sediment, mean annual inflow, mean annual inflow of sediment, um, how much of the time during the year does sediment come in, bed load, suspended load, uh, economic parameters, uh, the unit value of water, for example, is probably the most significant. And then sediment management alternatives. For each of the many alternatives that we've discussed in this series of webinars, you as the user need to define each one with its own set of variables. For example, for hydrosuction sediment removal, you would define a pipeline diameter, how many pipes, the length of pipe, when hydrosuction sediment would begin, how long it would last, how much water it would use, when it needs to be replaced because of uh, usage, et cetera. Now the output is interesting because it is not based on a so-called 50 year or 100 year time horizon. It's looking at sustainability. The question is, can you operate this dam for 300 years? That itself is an artificial deadline, but it's certainly longer than what we're looking at right now. And it compares present values, and it gives you a plot of net present value, where net present value is the difference between benefits and costs. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on this slide. It's a very busy slide, but very important for us that do sediment management. So I'll explain this carefully. The x-axis has the acronym CAP over MAF. Here, CAP is the storage capacity of your reservoir. MAF is the mean annual water inflow, and it's a ratio. For example, if CAP is one, that means that the reservoir is large enough to store all the mean annual inflow um, that comes in in one year. If cap is equal to 0 0.01, that means essentially you could fill that reservoir 10 times a year with the mean annual inflow. So smaller reservoirs on the left, bigger reservoirs on the right relative to inflowing water. The y-axis is also a dimensionless ratio, cap once again, but then divided by MAS, where MAS is the mean annual sediment inflow. That is how much sediment comes into the reservoir project area every year. Now I'll explain all of this in just a moment, but I'm going to preview for you um, a dam we'll look at in just a moment. It's called Millsite. And I featured Millsite in the last webinar on permitting. Uh, quite a bit of detail was in that webinar on this project. Here's where Millsite plots. The ratio of capacity divided by mean annual inflow is about 0.43, meaning that there's enough water to fill that reservoir about two and a half times or so per year. The cap divided by MAS is, is about 240, meaning that um, compared to the water inflow, the sediment inflow is relatively small. Now I'll explain the rest of the busy diagram for you. 
Here on the right is the legend. These are different sediment management alternatives. You'll, you'll be familiar with these now because they've been explained in, in previous webinars. And each one of these symbols has been placed onto this diagram depending on individual dams and their XY coordinates, like Millsite Dam right here. Also located on this graph is, it, 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 it almost looks like a Shields diagram. Beneath this line, your project is essentially not sustainable. Above this line, it can be potentially sustainable. And notice how most of the dams, each one of these, represents a dam. And uh, these are primarily dams in Japan, uh, the source by Sumi and uh, Kantush et al. Uh, was presented in a workshop that uh, Tim sponsored a few years ago. Finally, on this diagram, you can see where these management alternatives fit. Drawdown flushing, hydrosuction dredging uh, uh, are best for smaller reservoirs. For very large reservoirs, you're going to simply store it or maybe get lucky with density current flushing. So a very busy diagram, but this diagram is the single most important graph that we use when considering sediment management. ResCon also uses this concept. So now let me show you the results of an analysis for Millsite Dam. As I mentioned before, this was featured a few weeks ago uh, in the webinar. Millsite Dam uh, was featured in the permitting webinar a few weeks ago. Now, remember, this is feasibility level only. What do we have here? If we look at sediment bypass, that is constructing a canal around the reservoir that intersects sediment as it comes into the reservoir and moves it downstream, it turns out to be not sustainable, meaning that eventually the reservoir would fill with sediment anyway. Now, economically, during the period of operation, the net present value is positive, which means it pays, but it's not sustainable. The same is true for hydrosuction sediment removal. That is, it's not sustainable. Eventually, the reservoir is going to fill with sediment during the time of operation. It does have a net present value that's positive. The height of the bar indicates the net present value for different interest rates. I want to draw your attention to the gray one right here. This gray one um, yields a slightly higher net present value than a straight 7%. What is this? This gray bar represents a discount rate that diminishes or goes down with time. In other words, if you're looking at 25 years into the future, you might be using 7%, but perhaps at year 30, that drops down to maybe 4%. And then at year 50 or 60, it drops down to 2%. And then at year 100, it may drop down to 1%. This appears to be a more reasonable way to discount uh, benefits back to present value. This has been adopted by the World Bank and new projects funded by the World Bank now will use a declining discount rate and that will make sustainability at least a little bit higher uh, alternative that can be considered. 15% is not an unusual rate uh, required at international projects. So something to keep in mind here, ResCon 2 is feasibility level only. And as I look at these numbers, I'm not sure I believe exactly the number, but I certainly can look at the comparisons and the relative values. So ResCon 2 is a tool that we might be able to use for evaluating the effectiveness of sediment management alternatives. Well, there's a few more things that we might consider into the future here in the US. It's obvious that we're going to start, we're, we're, we need to start saving money now for sediment management here in the US. As the federal government and private dams who are undergoing um, rehabilitation, that's going to require funding. How can we start saving money? An interesting idea, an obvious one is called the beneficiary pays principle. That means if you are the direct beneficiary 
of um, a benefit from a dam, you should pay for um, future sediment management. Some escrow fund, a retirement fund, some fund of some kind. Now, what does that mean? That means if I'm an irrigator downstream, the price of my water is going to go up. Um, if I'm living in a 100-year floodplain, the cost of flood insurance might go up. Um, if I'm doing recreation, perhaps the recreation fee will go up. It's obvious that we need to start saving money now for future sediment management or for decommissioning. Consider insurance policies on existing dams. Buy an insurance policy. When it gets to the day of decommissioning, the insurance policy becomes active, kind of like collecting on life insurance. But unfortunately, we're not dealing with young dams here in the US. More than half of the dams in the national inventory of dams, more than half of those are more than 50 years old. And I can tell you that the cost of life insurance goes up as you get older. Nonetheless, uh, we need to consider this uh, for our future. Well, uh, that's the end of the presentation. And I've, uh, I've scheduled this so there might be time for some questions here at the end. Um, perhaps you've been typing those. Uh, Toby, at the moment, uh, I can't see any questions. I don't know if it's possible to see those or not. But thank you for your um, attention today. This webinar has been a challenging one to produce because this is relatively new material. It's not like we're reviewing the Manning equation or gradually varied flow. We're talking about issues that are very important to us, but they've not been fully implemented as of yet. This is the goal of several efforts going on right now. And uh, I would appreciate your comments, corrections, and questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rowan. So uh, we do have some questions. Uh, let's see, the first one I'm going to uh, ask is regarding Gavin's Point Dam. And let me see if we can get to it here. Toby, is there a way I can see that question that helps me out a bit? Uh, yeah, so at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A note there. We were trying to keep them a little un un anonymous. So it looks like some people have figured out how to do it, but um, Oh, I see. I think um, it looks like these are, I think, I think we can go with the uh, non-anonymized. Okay, I'll just uh, listen very carefully. I'm not seeing that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the first one, at least, is uh, relatively straightforward. So the question is, at Gavin's Point Dam, uh, how was the 70% cost of upstream damage estimate calculated? By actual expenses, expenditures, that is money spent. Um, I did a freedom of information request and asked the question, how much money has been spent on sediment damage upstream from Gavin's Point? So that's actual invoices, money paid out, receipts, those kinds of things. Okay, great, thank you. So we have another one. Um, this one might be a little bit tricky to, uh, to read off, but I'll try. I'll do, uh, it's a several part question, but I'll do it in sections. So uh, the first part is you have pointed out quite problems with the federal benefit cost methodology. What is the process to modify it? So questions of you know, how okay. long would it take to do that? Who has yeah, to? Let me address that one. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It is part of law. OMB, the Office of Management is, and Budget, is mandated to follow that. And as I've discussed this with representatives from OMB, they look at me like I'm a five-year-old. How naive can you be? This is not going to be changed. I honestly, frankly, am unsure how this would change, but it would, re uh, it would require an act of Congress. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second part of the question is, as far as I know, we do not have a good method for estimating the cost of degradation downstream of a dam. This information is essential in order to evaluate man management alternatives. Could the SOS identify this as a research priority? That might be a nice uh, task for the SOS. We certainly understand completely now the physical process of scour. So you numerically predict scour as it progresses downstream and over time. And then you look at two things. One is local infrastructure. That is bridge piers, abutments, 
intakes for water, uh, city water supplies, nuclear power plants, and those things. Um, the second thing you look at is upstream progressing degradation on tributaries, and then you can estimate damages in the same way. The second part of that is to make some estimate of environmental impacts. That's not as easy from a monetary point of view, but it can be done. But I'll suggest this to uh, Tim and others who serve on the uh, sedimentation uh, subcommittee. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, I think this is in regard to the chart that you had put up. The, uh, I think you, ref you referenced as a, a similar to a shields diagram chart. Um, yeah. The question is, how is the boundary between sustainability and not sustainable uh, determined on the chart? Yeah, it's really fuzzy. It's, it, it, that black line is not an equation. It's, it's somebody's interpretive sketch. Uh, but basically it's saying if you've got a very large dam relative to inflow, for example, uh, Garrison and Fort Peck on the Missouri River each take about three years to fill. How are you going to get sediment downstream from such a dam or downstream from Hoover Dam? Uh, th there's just really nothing you can do. So those projects are not sustainable. They may last a very long time because it will take a long time to fill the sediment. Um, ResCon tries to give you a number as it does its analysis, but this black line is based on experience and, and, and that's about all. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, another question. Has the US ACE or uh, reclamation begun the process of factoring this methodology into their dams? No. <laughs> okay. Are there are there any discussions about that, or is there a thought about how well, to do? I that? try to be direct in my answers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I say, a challenge of this particular webinar is we're talking about concepts that are uh, rather difficult and would require some some deep changes. And in the meantime, both of these federal agencies that were mentioned have an a, a, an extremely difficult task to carry out everything they're supposed to do with limited budget. I'll give you a specific example. The US Army Corps of Engineers and their projects around the country have more visits by people than all of our national parks in the United States combined. All the fees collected from all those visits go straight to the treasury. They're not retained locally for o &M. All of the hydropower generated at Corps of Engineers projects, uh, the benefits from that go back to the National Treasury. They do not contribute to o &M. So it would require some pretty deep changes to increase the amount of money available to consider um, what needs to be done. I am not familiar with what happens at Bureau projects for either hydropower or recreation. I, I can't address that. But uh, that's why my one word answer, I, I believe is the present situation. No, they haven't incorporated this. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, could you please describe how the costs of sediment management have to be compared to the cost of dam decommissioning and building new reservoirs somewhere else? Well, sediment management is kind of an ongoing uh, process, but it has to be funded up front. And that's the difficult part. Imagine when you go out to buy a new car and um, an option you have is to pay $10,000 more for a benefit that kicks in at about 100,000 miles. Well, you might say, well, that's not worth it. I'll just get a new car at that time. Well, if we apply the same logic to our dams and we don't want to pay upfront costs for large low level outlets or a bypass tunnel, when we get to that end of the project life when dead storage is full and benefits have been reduced, it's not like we're going to say, well, let's just build a new dam because we've exhausted the best sites available already of course we can build a new dam, 
but it will be at a site that is less profitable, that will be trickier for geology or transportation or storage, and it's going to cost a lot more than that new car that you opted to replace the old one with in my example. So sediment management has a capital cost up front, some ongoing costs, but the cost of decommissioning a dam and building a new one, astronomical. As a matter of fact, it's been done so rarely, we don't have a very good database on the cost of decommissioning. And you can't simply decommission if the project benefits are necessary. I'll, uh, I'll ask a follow-up question on that. Um, you know, so uh, other types of engineering, say building engineering, that sort of thing, they often use bonds to help finance decommissioning costs. Has that been thought of in the context of dams? It's not. Um, I, I'm not sure why. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. In forestry, when we talk about resource extraction, uh, when you cut down a tree, you're required to plant so many more trees. That's so the forest is sustainable. Um, there are limits on the harvesting of fish in the ocean. That is so we don't kill all the fish. Uh, when we extract minerals from the earth, we can't replace them, but bonds are required to fix the damage, environmental and physical damage that's done when the, da when the mine is closed. But no such requirements or strategies exist for dams. I find that very interesting. But at present time, there, there, there is no such uh, requirement that I'm aware of. OK, thank you. Uh, a few more questions here. Uh, see, the next question is, has anyone looked at sediment contamination from mercury? What means and methods would be used to remove and dispose of mercury contaminated sediments? Well, that's a really good question. And you know, this webinar has presumed something perhaps naive. And that is that the sediment deposits upstream are contaminant free. If that's not the issue, then passing sediments downstream um, is not likely to happen. In that case, um, I'm thinking of Hartsville Reservoir out of uh, Clemson, South Carolina where there is mercury contamination and they actually don't want that sediment moved or disturbed. So the idea there is to cap the uh, current contaminated sediments with fresh sediment deposits that are not contaminated. But it raises an interesting philosophical question. Remember one of my first slides said that a dam owner, et cetera, is not obligated to trap sediment. If the sediment that's trapped behind a dam is contaminated, there's an instant benefit for downstream users. That, for example, mercury contaminated sediment does not have to be treated downstream. It's being trapped in the reservoir. The question is, how much is the dam owner being paid for that benefit? And the answer is zero. Now, when the time comes to manage the sediments and it's contaminated with mercury or heavy metals or, or other things, who's going to bear the cost of that? Let's say you cap it in place, et cetera. So there's some, there's some interesting philosophical discussions that are raised. The webinar today presumes that we are, are not bound by contaminants in, in managing sediment, at least introducing it to downstream waters. I hope that helped with the question. Yes, thank you. Because next question, uh, what would be a uh, potentially guess percentage on capital cost to account for ongoing dredging or annual needs for a reservoir? I, uh, I'm not going to give an estimate. I don't know. Um, I don't know. We don't have enough track record here in the US mm -hmm. uh, uh, for that kind of data. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'm sure it depends on the individual reservoir as well. Uh, let's see, next question. Uh, could you comment on international experience and success in moving towards sustainability? Yes, um, we are in better shape internationally in some ways, 
um, our friends and colleagues abroad have had to deal with higher sediment loads typically than we have here in the US. And so in many cases, they've had to deal with sediment management from the design stage or retroactively uh, deal with it. A Sandman Shaw Reservoir on the Yellow River comes to mind, uh, et cetera, where low level outlets were added after the dam was built to pass sediment downstream. Not done universally though, it's done certainly, certainly more often in here uh, than here in the US. The techniques that uh, you're, if you're looking at your computer screen now, all those techniques were pretty much developed abroad based on their experience. Our international colleagues though have their own challenges when it comes to sediment management and that is higher discount rates, which discourages uh, upfront capital costs. It, it, it's a challenge, but uh, they've, they've had a lot of success uh, with this in Japan, China, um, Europe, Switzerland, Italy, uh, many countries. Okay, thank you. Um, a little bit of a related note. Uh, does the government or other regulatory agencies have detailed requirements on what a site needs to be decommissioned to in the case that a reservoir has been filled with a significant volume of sediment? Or is it based on natural pre-project conditions? Toby, would you mind repeating that question? The uh, specifics of it I didn't catch. Sure, yeah. I think that the question is basically following dam decommissioning, um, is there a requirement as to what the state is that the uh, sort of natural river needs to be returned to? Oh, well, gee whiz, that's a, that's a whole other philosophical discussion and a quite interesting one. There's no agreed upon standard. Uh, Tim Randall, if he were with me on the webinar, could talk about um, the Elwha River and what condition that was supposed to be returned to upon removal of Glines Canyon and the Elwha Dams. He's probably got the best answer to this question. Uh, short of that, however, uh, the philosophical question is, to what state do you restore a dam? To pre-dam conditions or to conditions that existed 50 years after the dam was built? Um, that question has not, does not have a general answer. I wish Tim could jump in here and give us his experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure he has a mic on right now, but uh, good, okay. And we are kind of, we are, some of these questions, thanks for uh, answering these, Roland. It's, uh, some of these are veering away from the economics per se, but uh, I think they're interesting to talk about. Um, so let's do, uh, let's do one more question. Um, so it's not really pertaining exactly to economics, but uh, uh, more to general dam design. So the question is, um, the Three Gorges Dam is included in the sediment design. Uh, low level gates essentially during low, during flood periods maintained by um, uh, essentially low water periods to increase stream velocities. So how many dams in the US have such design concepts? Few if any. Yeah. One perhaps accidentally designed that way is called Guernsey Dam. It's on the North Platte River. It's a Bureau of Reclamation project. And every year, around the 4th of July, the reservoir is completely emptied by uh, opening propitiously placed low-level outlets. Uh, that uh, empties the reservoir and it scours deposited silt, moves it into the large irrigation canals downstream, where eventually it ends in farmers' fields, and that's exactly where they want it. That silt helps seal the soil profile a little bit so infiltration doesn't proceed so quickly that it goes right past the root zone. I don't believe Guernsey Dam was planned that way, but it's operated that way. I'm not aware of, um, I, I can't tell you the names of any projects here in the US that were designed like that. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go ahead and end there. Um, Dr. Roland Hotchkiss, thank you very much for uh, all of your great time in putting this together, it's really appreciated. And uh, I think with that, we will end uh, this webinar and also end the webinar series. So thanks very much.